Dakota native Pat Haggerty took a small Texas exploration company in 1945 into a global semiconductor leader by 1965. Texas Instruments had a booming wholesale and defense contracting business and was very profitable, but Haggerty knew it was time to transition once again. He had an idea in the early 70s he wanted to make a low-cost semiconductor or CPU that would, that would power a computer for the home with implications for commercial, educational, and recreational uses. By 1974, T.I. Haggerty did not have his chip, but the TMS-1000, a 4-bit chip, which would find its way into hundreds of industrial applications and controlled most of the microwave ovens of the era. Microwave ovens and a lot of, that was kind of one of the first really heavily embedded processes. A team led by Wally Rimes, who, among other things, was the inventor of the blue LED, did develop a 16-bit chip, the 9900, and announced it in 1975. But there were no 16-bit peripherals to go with it. In fact, Rhines actually pitched the, use, uh, the idea of using the chip for the IBM PC to IBM. He was turned down, but the result of this was a 9980 chip would ultimately end up in a TI-994. Whatever, whatever it was, he was not a conformist, and his manager uh, apparently got upset with him and finally fired him for his, whatever whatever his quirks were. And when they, they got other other engineers to go in there however this guy thought he had a bunch of pieces that there nobody could figure out any way to you know to fit them all together and finish it so and they had already had all the downstream peripherals and stuff designed the bus so they took a 9900 which was obviously a lot more expensive initially in a ceramic package and they added a bunch of extra logic around it to basically convert that the the 16-bit memory cycles into two 8-bit memory cycles. And of course, in the process of doing that, they slowed it down because a 16-bit memory access on the 9900 took two clocks. And by the time you, you made it into two 8-bit cycles, it took six clocks. By 1977, TI decided to use this chip in their own computer. So they moved from the Moss division in Houston to the new consumer products division in Lubbock. This caused another problem. Getting the talent required for the project to be difficult much would come from contractors and college interns. I started in Lubbock, but both all of my time in Lubbock was as a, what they used to call a cooperative education student. Okay. Uh, they call them interns now. I did two different sessions. But perhaps the biggest problem would be actually making the programs for the new computer. It lacked an assembler. It required the use of a $50,000 mini computer and proprietary language known as graphics programming language or GPL. There were no integers. Everything was full was full <laughs> floating point, and TI Basic was written almost wholly in GPL. And GPL, so you have an, a basic interpreter written in GPL, and GPL itself was an inter, was an interpreted language, and there was a GPL interpreter written in 9900 language. This language is so dead now. A Google search on it produced nothing. This was in spite of many titles, including Tunnels, Tunnels of Doom. Being written on it. So, Tunnels of Doom was written by a, a gentleman named Kevin Kenny, mm -hmm. and and uh, uh, really uh, genius kind of guy. Kevin was a little different. I think I think Kevin was the 994A version of the of the 9985 designer in Houston that only our management, you know, knew, you know, basically let Kevin be himself. But the interesting thing about Tunnels of Doom is, you know, he's got the that 3D perspective to it. You know, you're going down a hallway. Mm -hmm. And he did that all in graphics one mode. So in graphics one mode, uh, uh, you only have, uh, you know, the, all of the TI modes are character oriented. You, you put, you say, I want this eight by eight character at this position on the screen. And you've got 32, you get 32 columns and 24 rows. So you only have enough. If you, if you, if you multiply that, that's 768 positions on the screen, but there's only 256 characters that you can have. Right. So you can't have so so to do what he did, he had to actually go and and and, and allocate his tiles. And when he had corners, you know, non-solid, he had to figure out where his corners were and go find, you know, pull one out of the pool and dynamically define the characters, you know, to 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 define the scene. It was wow. really, uh, yeah, it was it was ahead of its time for the kind of thing he was doing on, you know. With, with the architecture that he had, because that was written before the 4A came out. The big push would be educational. Although when, when I got involved with selling the calculators, and uh, excuse me, the 4, the 99 4A to schools, 
then we were we were squaring off against Apple, which was a very tough thing to do. Uh, because I remember some school districts, we were there trying to sell stuff and Apple had just left a whole truckload of them there free. Point in time, I had actually suggested to Fred Busey that we just buy Apple. I said, look, if you really want to get into this business and play it seriously, why don't you just buy Apple and, and leave them the hell alone? And uh, no, 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 we, we can do anything better. We're better than my nose. Upstarts out in California. Why don't you know? <laughs> all right, all right. Fred, to, to do the software on this, we're going to need LA level talent. Why? Well, I mean, I there's plenty of talent right here in Texas. Why didn't you? I mean, like, no, you know, so, and of course I was, I don't know, usually when they referred to me, it would start with God damn. You're a goddamn Yankee with a U-Haul anyway. Eric Johnson. And um, Johnson obviously was very, very well connected to the education community. So he sort of leaned on Fred Busey to, he was getting complaints from his friends in the education community and basically, uh, the computer's shortcomings, such as lack of disk support, and a chiclet keyboard were dismissed. This design, a lot of us were arguing about the keyboard. A lot of us were arguing, you know, this, this keyboard's tough to use, you know, and it's not it's not very, and, and, but an argument came back at the time to us. So, well, this isn't designed to be typed on. This is designed, uh, this is designed for, for, for kids, you know, they'll mostly be pointing and clicking and maybe hitting a key or two here and there, but the modules are going to run that this is an educational tool. Basically, it was a very minor variation on the calculator, the calculator keys, and I, maybe that was part of the part of the, the the appeal was that they could pretty much, with minor cost, modify the calculator type keyboard and keys and stuff. TI developed a low cost method of putting ROM in a cartridge to allow it to run programs far more complicated than a computer could run on its own, called GROM. There were no integers. Everything was full was full <laughs> floating point, and TI Basic was written almost wholly in GPL and GPL. So you have an, a basic interpreter written in GPL, and GPL itself was an inter, was an interpreted language, and there was a GPL interpreter written in 9900 language. Toms were all about, and they were very much like the architecture, like the uh, the, the video memory. You had an 8-bit data bus, and you if you wanted to access a memory location in the in the Grom, you had to write two bytes of address, and then you could read the data, and you could write a you could multi read the that you could read strings of data at sequential addresses by just doing one more data access. But if you had to jump down, then you had to go and put two more bytes of address is it was very compact, right? Anytime you move up a level of abstraction in language, it takes a lot less statements to, you know, to, to cause an action to happen. So anyway, all the games that you see, all the educational games that Ralph has, has, has mentioned, you know, all of that stuff was almost wholly written in GPL. There were very few things with assembly language in the cartridge. Chess had a had a ROM in it because it would have just run too, too slow to have it all written in right. GPL. But almost all... So Logo had... Um, you know, basically there was uh, something on the screen called a turtle and you could move the turtle forward, you know, up one to the left, to the right, back and everything else. And then you could add another command where the turtle had a pencil in its tail and you could put the pencil up or the pencil down and then you could change the color of the pencil. That was it. But in terms of creating commands for the turtle, it was a lisp language. The the nine, the video chip, even the the the, the sprites were unchanged between the two. The cool thing about Logo, and, and in fact, the asteroids and Sprite, uh, the asteroids in Parsec, were de I designed those in Logo. You could actually write some code in Logo to sequence through a bunch of sp sprites on the screen at the same time that you had this uh, bitmap editor up that was basically like a large, you know, jigsaw puzzle or, or, or a large crossword puzzle you know with big pixels if you will so you could you could you could have that thing switch between patterns that you were editing the bitmap on and you could live edit the bitmap while the logo program was running and cycling through the different patterns to give you the rotating at asteroid effect it was really cool but it would be a couple years after the introduction of the unit a serious effort would be put in the marketing of computer to the general public. You know, were we, how hard were we going to push on the four? It's an educational unit. It's mm -hmm. designed for very simple software. The plug-in modules were so easy a kid could use them. There was no real magic to plugging the modules in and out. Floppies took a little, you know, more care in hand-holding. 
And again, the other thing, you know, it, it, I think TI was constantly kind of weighing just how much should we invest in this consumer yeah. business. Strategic planning conference once a year was sort of a major showcase for all the divisions. And consumer really was sort of a beleaguered division because people were expecting miracles from it and not realizing, I mean, you know, we were, were launching a business of very high cost to launch, you know, retail prices. And, you know, so, you know, Ron Ritchie, who at the time was running it, would give his presentation. And then, and then the guys from the Defense Systems and Electronics Group that were selling the Harm missile would, would show their stuff. The TI-994 was one of several TI-99 releases planned, all centered around the same TMS-9900 architecture. The 99-2 was a real cost-reduced version of, a, of the 994A, and it never made it, mainly because... You know, the price wars had already started on the 99.4 and we were already, TI was losing their shirt because they're trying to compete with us, you know, with Commodore, which had a lot less silicon, you know, than right. the most cost. And, mm -hmm. and McCann Erickson had done a bunch of market research on the, um, on the three computers. And of all three of them, that was the one they said, stop what you're doing, just get that working. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants this. Everyone wants a computer you can put in an airplane, sit in your lap, runs on a battery. It, you know, there was a, this was a laptop long before, you know, th this was a laptop from science fiction. Mm -hmm. And um, oh, this was a business computer. This mm -hmm. was not, this was uh, spreadsheets, word processing, dual disk, um, screaming. Actually, we were all very impressed. Uh, one of the large national publications, I think it was Time Magazine, did a story after the four was released. And I believe the quote was that TI, you know, threw away the, the two diamonds and kept the lump of coal. Yeah. <laughs> At the end of a CES show, you'd go down into the basement and bid on your space for the next mm -hmm. year. Wow. And I remember sitting there with uh, the guy who was running our trade show operation, Roland Kambach. And he's sitting there and he's all excited. He says, all right, our turn's up next. I got, that's the space I want. That's the space. I, maybe I'll get it. Maybe I'll see. He's, 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 so finally, he's, um, Texas Instruments, Roland Combat. He says, great, I'll take this, 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 and this. Great. We all, we got that for only $350,000. And I'm sitting there, <laughs> and I'm going, uh, Roland, that's just for the space. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's really good space. And I'm going, yeah. That's, and uh, the budget for this was mine at the time. And I'm, so 350 G's just for the space. Now we got a booth. Then we'll have everybody coming down here. I mean, there's no way to know really what a trade show costs. You know, will we, how hard were we going to push on the four? It's an educational unit. It's designed for very simple software. The plug-in modules were so easy a kid could use them. There was no real magic to plugging the modules in and out. Floppies took a little, you know, more care in handholding. And again, the other thing, you know, it, it, I think TI was constantly kind of weighing just how much should we invest in this consumer business? Will it ever pay off? Will we ever be able to uh, see the kind of return that our shareholders expect from a it business? Kind of the form factor of the 2600 and the game, you know, the game consoles were that same format. So they were already used to that in a, you know, you know, in a computing device, you know, you know, wrapped up as a game. The other thing people were enthralled with was just how easy it was to change, you know, so you, you, well, you snap this out, you snap this in, you press a few keys, bam, you're doing this, you're bam, you're doing that. So the command module idea, again, which ties to the idea of why command modules, why this form factor, we could have made them a lot of different sizes. Mm -hmm. Well, it was really designed so that a child would, could handle it. And the big, they were threatened and raised a big internal turmoil as why is Lubbock and Croach, we do the business computing, they do the fun stuff, why are we doing this? But the 6502 is in all the other 8-bits. And because of a lifetime deal for DOS on a chip made with Microsoft, Commodore had no intention of going back to that negotiating table. So just a couple months after the ti 9948 came out, the VIC-20 came out for just 249 but by now, TI had the games. Over a thousand titles available, plus Atari had delivered on their promise to bring the best games to the TI. The TI came out with all the peripherals and designed neatly to fit into a new box called the PEB, or Peripheral Expansion Box. The PEB gave TI-99 legs, promising limitless expansion possibilities for the future, much like the IBM or Apple. When the TI-99 came out, there would be no need to replace the PEB, as it would work just as well with that. And true to its promise, while the 8 never came out, a third-party manufacturer came up with a whole new computer on a card called the Swan 
which dropped right into PEB and was the 8 that never was. But just as the TI had originally had had production issues, so did the PEB. Although it was built like an absolute tank at 50 pounds empty, the PEB was expensive. With a single floppy, it came in at a whopping $1,000. In spite of this, demand was high. TI ended up selling 250000 or one for every 10 994 produced, but it might have sold 500000 had they just gotten them faster, and they made them cheaper even more. So with the PEB, TI now had a system to compete in the low end with the Atari 800, and on the high end with the Apple II. Commodore had nothing, really. The VIC-20 was underpowered, had almost no RAM out of the box, which had no advantage to TI. Either machine required more stuff to use it. But TI met Commodore head-to-head -head in the retail space. Having no success early on with computer stores, the ti 994 a was sold at discount stores. The VIC-20 met them there and started a price war. And most people assume that this was just a shot across the bow that killed TI. But in fact, it was not. TI dropped, prompted it to drop its price all the way down to 299. Commodore followed suit, going all the way down to 175. Then, in a genius move, TI offered a $100 mail in rebate. Between the low price, great games, ease of use, and retail availability, this, re this rebate be made the TI begin to outsell the VIC 4 to 1. It became the number one selling computer of 1982. Performance like that deserves a proper 80s montage, doesn't it? We had, the, we had a brand name and a reputation from the early calculator days. We had the sort of the educational cachet. We were serious, you know, serious about this. And we went after schools tooth and nail. So that when um, when parents were seeing their kids, you know, show up with these things at school, we had a, you know, a connection there. So um, when, when it started getting really competitive, particularly when we, and then remember, we had a whole basket. We had speak and spell when, you know, the... Um, TI also had the best-selling software, only Pac-Man was a better seller than Parsec, and they had several spots in the top 10. It was around this time that TI decided to drop to 992 in favor of a cost-reduced beige 994A replacement that had circuitry to lock out unlicensed software. Like we were going to write all of the software yes. and, uh, and get all of the profit from all this. Why would we turn any of that over to other people? And I remember having that argument with, um, actually, I had it with Fred Busey. The 996 never solved its floppy problem, and the 998 was just around the corner. There was a lot of hope at TI. They finally turned a small profit on the computer in 1982. First quarter of 1983, however, saw Commodore drop the VIC all the way down to $100, with a manufacturing cost of $130. Competing with the VIC, which had a manufacturing cost of $75, was impossible. The new ad blitz also clogged the airwaves with the slogan, A Real Computer for the Price of a Toy. And the Timex Sinclair didn't help either, selling 100,000 units a month right out of the gate. TI scrambled. Rather than release C8, which could have completed, competed with Commodore 64, uh, they chose to race to the bottom against the VIC. He also noticed that more and more shelf space was going to Commodore, who offered nothing more to retailers than a price point. This compared to TI's millions of dollars spent on supporting them. TI never wanted to make the gaming machine, but 1,000 titles, 850 of them were games, so with its 40-key keyboard, prominent cartridge slot, the video game crash of 1983 hit them much harder than it should have. And halfway through the year, it was announced that a problem with the AC adapter could cause a harmful shock. Any of the power supplies, and I think you, you might know the story, is that they were stamped by Underwriters Laboratories, but mm -hmm. Underwriters Laboratories had never seen them. Mm -hmm. That was the problem. UL refused to certify the TI-99 until the problem was repaired. 
Two months later, with TI stock trading at half of 1980 levels and hemorrhaging money, they announced that the TMS 9900 base machine would no longer be produced. By the end of the first quarter of 1984, the last TI-99 came off the assembly line, which closed for good, and the project was over. Ironically, almost all the base units were sold after TI announced it would stop selling in 99. Many of them had ended up selling for just $50. TI would continue to support the 99s in one form or another for years following the end. Warranty support even helped launch third-party distributors, including Ted Wade of Gateway 2000 fame. And until 2011, they continued to manufacture Intel-based machines under the TI name and several OEMs. In the 90s, there continued to be a healthy number of users supporting the platform, but by 2000, interest had waned, and the TI became a historical footnote. The last several years, however, the TI-99 has seen a resurgence of interest. With 2.8 million produced, it had become the cheapest retro computer platform available. A host of emulators, new games, including this licensed version of Dragon Slayer, came out. Even the TI-99 BBS is now operating. This resurgence is a testament to how well these were made. Commodore and Sinclair machines are still available, but almost all of them require some effort to get working properly, while all the TI-99 4As still work, with very few exceptions. And who knew that TI sticking to its quality guns in 1983 would pay dividends in 2021, but it has. The plucky little computer from the plains of Lubbock, Texas, breathes life once again. Thanks for watching, and if you like this, please like button and subscribe. If you don't, then why are you watching a retro computing YouTube channel in the first place?